Welcome to the Woodbury Word. I'm Wood. And I'm Dre. And if you tuned in last episode, uh, we made mention to uh, the Real Black Menswear Media Group and their inaugural magazine that was being launched uh, with the good brothers over there. So today we're bringing you a special treat. Um, before we jump into that, we do want to recognize that it is Black History Month. We have not said that explicitly, that it is Black History Month. But one of the yeah, things man. we want to do over here is make Black history everyday history. And we do not, yes, sir. We do not want to uh, set aside a special time for that. Every time we turn on these mics, we want that to be Black history in the making. So yes. while we have not said all right, this is Black History Month. This is what we're doing for this episode. This is what we're doing for this week. We do hope that you see the Black history that's being made and the people that we bring to you, the topics that we try to cover. So uh, I just wanted to get that out of the way. But uh, today with us, we have a special guest. I've met this brother years ago, and he has been yes. as true, genuine, and real on day one as he is today. Uh, this is my brother, Jay Gatz, from the Real Black Menswear Media Group. They just launched their inaugural magazine, as we mentioned earlier, and they've got a Thank lot you. coming. Um, and uh, Stay tuned. Buckle up. Yeah, but uh, yeah, Jay, welcome, man. Welcome, man. Hey, listen, man. Thank you guys for having me. You know, I had to stop by the Woodbury Word. You know, I, ch I check you guys all the time, and um, we talk all the time outside of this platform. And, uh, you know, as I've told you all before, I support real black media, uh, media that gives our community a message. And also, I think it's important to also give our community. Um, I, I think we have to challenge our community and give uh, our community more things to think about critically. That's one of the main things uh, that we try to put in place of real black men's work, even for a uh, media group, even with men that are familiar with the style world. We like to kind of play devil's advocate to people, you know, for the people we see on social media and the different platforms who do claim to be some of the most stylish people walking. All we do is ask questions. And and typically the questions work out pretty well. So um yeah man. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> they typically work out well and sometimes mm -hmm. they call <laughs> they hold folks to task. <laughs> Absolutely. What what th this is the thing. You know with when I was at Ralph Lauren, uh, my Frederick Parker, um, brother, he, uh, did, I, I, he's like my uncle, man. Frederick, uh, did my first, uh, made to measure. He helped, he like coached me through my first made to measure sale. And one thing that, that Frederick said to me, um, when I was at Ralph Lauren a long time ago, he said, you know, he said, Jay, you have to learn how to take uh, compliments with a discernment. And I, I think that's, uh, kind of something that a lot of the millennial community has lost a, a, a lost touch of a little bit because the thing is there's nothing wrong with uh you getting a compliment obviously we all like compliments there's nothing wrong with compliments but what we do have to do we have to consider the source of those compliments you have to consider the source the source of a compliment it speaks volumes and i think a lot of times a lot of the brothers uh specifically millennial guys they take the compliments, but there's no discernment, you know? So a lot of times when, when you have a million people telling you you're good at something, you know, you're this, you're that, you're that, that's great too. But it's like one, first of all, who in the hell said that? And two, <laughs> it's like compared to what? Yeah, right. See, for me, people say, you know, to me all the time, hey, you know, I don't like to compare things. Well, I don't give a damn. I do. Compare and contrast is how you learn. Right. How do you learn if you don't compare? That's right. How would I know the difference between LeBron James and Michael Jordan if I didn't compare them? Right. That's right. So actually, I do like to compare. And I think most people should compare because it's good for educational purposes. Um, I think most people, when you look at when they compare, it's done out of a spirit of competitiveness. And that's where that that's where a lot of that negativity comes from. When you compare in the spirit to educate yourself, I think a lot of times the outcome is uh it's a lot different, but I, I personally love comparing and contrasting that single handedly is how I've, I've been able to uh, learn so much. And, and the thing is, that's my way of learning, not to say that everyone has to learn like that, but I would definitely encourage people to um, definitely, you know, get into those things. Take take dressing as, as a craft. Yeah. 
take it as a craft. You know, dressing is just like anything else. It's it's like it's like cooking. Yeah, you do it every day. But the only difference is, you know, with a, clothes are a little different because you physically have to put them on every day. So it's a slightly a little different. People, di- you know, mentally they look at it different. But not. Nah, it's the same as a cookbook. There are ways to do things, and there are ways not to do things. There are certain ingredients that I will never be able to make without certain ingredients. I can't make cake without eggs and flour, no matter how good of a cook I am. That's right. That's no, right. no you doubt. Know what I'm no right. Doubt. Getting you, guys to look at it from that perspective. You, you, you brought up a good point, and I wanted to go to that because one of the things I really appreciate about the real black men's wear. A movement is the education piece of it. You yeah. did a series of tutorials, breakdowns of how Prince and Michael Jackson took aspects from James Brown, yes, not just yes, in yeah. their performance, but in their attire. Absolutely. So the comparative and you know contrast aspect that you're talking about is very informative because you can see there's nothing really new we're all no. just kind of taking pieces from here and there and seeing what works and then we come up with our you know standard look. But see, that's the difference though. And you notice I always put that in the in the, t- the tutorials, the modules, whatever you call it. Uh I always that's one word I like to use, innovation. You know, you look at a guy like Prince, he did take uh inspiration from James Brown, but the innovation piece is there and it's so innovative, it's not so simple, it's not so easy to tell. Michael uh, Jackson obviously borrowed from uh, Jackie Wilson, Sammy Davis, I mean, Michael Jackson borrowed from everyone, but he's so innovative in his approach and his execution is not so easy on the eye. You know, I like to break those things down for one, uh, one, just to get guys out of the habit of thinking that, style starts and begins with the suit you know like and 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 i like to break things down like that just so people can understand um as my my mentor avery told me like a a guy that really knows about style you could throw anything at him and he can talk about it and that's what uh he challenged me on years ago um when i um started uh the Lucas Dress Academy. I was talking all of the classic American menswear stuff where I was talking about Cary Grant, Fred Astaire, all that kind of stuff. And to be honest with y'all, he wasn't trying to hear that shit. He likes, so. oh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, this guy's a bespoke tailor. He like, oh. It looked like, and granted at the time, you know, looking back at it now, I understand. Right. But at the time, I know Mr. A was like, okay. Like, I know he didn't care because he knew it, but he challenged me. And I remember that was a humbling experience the first time I ever talked to Mr. Um, A, because at that time, that was one of those moments where I was at a point in my life where I was really feeling myself. I was feeling good about what I had going on in Atlanta. And I talked to him for like 10 minutes. And I I vividly remember getting off the phone, like vividly. And I remember thinking to myself, like, Jesus Christ, man, like you don't know shit. I, I vividly remember saying it to myself because I talked to him for 10 minutes and the level of um, the level of study. I mean, it was the, the depths. I mean, it was so deep. I mean, he asked me, I remember the first time I talked to him, he said, what do you think about Huey New? And for those of you that don't know, I am a member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. So Huey Newton was a member of the fraternity that I'm a part of. So obviously I am familiar with some of his history, but at that point I had never looked at him from a, a style perspective. But, you know, I only knew suits. But when I started looking, I said, wait a minute, he got the tam on. He got the uh, lambskin leather with the I mean, when you start looking, you're like, whoa, this is some pretty uh, this is some pretty stylish stuff. Right. So when you just kind of start going through history and culture, you'll find that a lot of the things that come from uh, that came from our community. Um, and a lot of people don't get mad when I say this, but uh, They're as interesting or more interesting than all of the things that we've been reading about in these men's uh, books for years. That's right. You and you highlight that often, which is one of the. Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. Let's let's get it straight. Let's get the source of the inspiration straight. Right. And you know what? And and a lot of times that's what, you know, folks get upset with you when when, when you start telling the truth. You know, I I had one guy. Yeah. Folks get upset with you, man. I had one brother uh, when a guy reached out to me and he said, Hey man, um, you know, I think Frank Sinatra was this, Frank Sinatra was that. But, you know, I told him one thing, you know, as Jay Z said, the numbers don't lie. 
<laughs> the numbers don't lie, bro. Like, like, like at this point, it is like it's provable through photograph, record, and interviewing situations that Frank Sinatra and every person in the Rat Pack took and borrowed from Nat King Cole. That's pretty clear. I mean, even Frank Sinatra said it. And he was open about it. I don't know why, why it seems like everyone else, but the men's were industry that want to accept that because like, when we start talking real, like, and I'm asking a question, how many, with the exception of the RBM media group, where have y'all really seen that King Cole being discussed as a style piece, like real talk. So the rape did something, seen? the rape did something after and you, you know why they did that after. After, yeah, of course they did. Of course they did. And they, tried, they did. and they tried to do it as if they, out of just some type of virtue, did it what? to honor him. I'm like, nope, too late. Too what late. Is the th- what is the thing about the rake? And you know, I, and I and, and I, I don't give a damn who doesn't like it. I'm just telling them what I see. I mean to be, I, and I don't care. It, it, the facts are facts. It's looking real rough over there for them right now. It's not looking too good. It's not looking too good for them right now. It's not. And, and, and these are just facts. You know, when you see people, uh, and, and we've seen it time after time, you know, with all these companies now switching uh, their marketing schemes. I mean, like, like I said, when you look at a lot of these publications, now let me now let me say this. I do have respect, and I and it's just the honest truth. I do admire Mr. Jim Moore and GQ for the work that they've been doing. They've done an exceptional job at making diverse material and they have programs and other um, incentives for people in our community. They have really taken a stand, not through posting, but through action. G, I can, I can say that GQ, ha- they've done a great job. I've, I've actually met a lot of people through some of the programs that they're doing. So GQ is doing a, um, a good thing. And and I and all honesty, I think they they have a good publication. They write really good articles. But when you see people completely switching up their marketing, uh, completely switching up their imagery, um, it, it 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 just doesn't make much sense. Because I think myself and a lot of black uh, men who are into men's decorum are asking one simple question: If you can post Sammy Davis and you can post Nat King Cole and all these other brothers, then why couldn't you say anything for uh, brother George Floyd? who left here much too soon for something ridiculous. And that's kind of where I have a problem with a lot of these people. You know what I mean? I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a hot or cold guy. It ain't no gray zone with me. You either gonna love me or you're gonna hate me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I don't like lukewarm messaging and I don't like people that want to treat me like they love me from a distance, you know? Or you want to be friendly, but not my friend. Listen, if you don't want to be friends, I'm okay with that. But what I ain't gonna do, I'm not gonna play with you and go back and forth. No, sir. That's Not me. I don't work in corporate America no more. There's no reason for me to do that. I have absolutely <laughs> I have no reason to do I, I don't. I have yeah. no reason to do it. And more importantly, now our community, we have a publication that is credible. We have one. So at this point, there is no magazine for anyone not that, that I cannot be placed in. We have our own magazine. And now people in our community can get the coverage and the notoriety that they, that they deserve. More importantly, I can tell more black people about what's going on in the community. So they won't have to go to Gucci or Louie or wherever, wherever they decide to shop with an institution that does not really care about our community. These are the things that are important. These are the things that are important to me. That's right. They just opened up a new Gucci store here in Charlotte. It's a damn shame. And you walk through the mall and the line and people are waiting it's a damn for shame. hours. And I'm like, come on, y'all. And look, it's, it's a shame. You know, we've done some of the whatever. Sure, of course. And it's all us in the line. Of course. And this conversation has been going on for decades, at least for those of us who have have known better. Sure. Understood that we can create our own brand. So, well, 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 this is the thing that that I don't understand. You know, and I'll be honest with y'all because you know we, like I said, we we gonna talk real, and I've been meaning to get on here with y'all for a while. It's the mindset that that I see. And I think it's more of a confidence piece. Now, for example, when I created, when we created the the, the Real Black Men's Wear group, I had, and y'all saw me post about this, I've had over 100 people ask me, and I'm talking about people in our community, and 100 people asked me, why would you call it Real Black Men's Wear? I had a million people ask me that question 
why does it always have to be about color, Jason? Why can't we just make something that looks good? And I said, well, listen, if Gucci can say made in Italy, then I can say real black menswear. That's right. If Vouv can say product of France, then I can say real black menswear. I don't understand the difference. And I tell you, you have to watch your mindset. But brothers and sisters, you have to watch your mindset when it comes to that thought process, because I'll be honest with you. And, and some people may, may agree with me. Don't really give a damn. This is how I feel. I feel a lot of times when we create something that is for our community or we create a product or something that is for, that is be, to be consumed. I think it's very important for us to stay true to who we really are. Black, let me ask, okay, let me ask y'all a question. If a black, if I'm a black man and I'm presenting a, I have a line, I'm presenting a line. And I've talked to people that have done this before. I haven't done it, but I'm just telling you. Y'all know, I, I know a lot of people and I know people that have done this. I've had, I know black people that have black brands that inovertly try to go around looking like they're a black brand. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Right. And I know y'all have come across that. But let me ask y'all this. And I'm, I don't like that mindset because how is that mindset different than crossing over like they used to do black people in the 60s, putting white people on black music like they did the five heartbeats? Right. Remember that? In the five heartbeats when they got mad because they, they recorded that music and they couldn't even put it out with their faces on. Yeah. Yep. To me, that is the same thing. For me, I'm not one of those guys, and that's why I got mad respect for people like Arsenio Hall, because Arsenio Hall created a tonight space, but Arsenio Hall never ran from who he was or his community, no. ever. No. He never ran from it. That's and true. I can appreciate that. And I'm one of those guys. You know, I've learned a lot. I've, met, I've you know, been able to travel. I've met a lot of good people. But on the flip side, you know, at the end of the day, I would rather hear Nat King Cole than Frank Sinatra. That, that these are just these are just you know what I'm saying right, right. And, and the thing is I'm not gonna feel bad about saying that you touched <laughs> you on know? you touched on Nat you touched on Mr. Lucas Dr. Churchwell let's talk about some of those early influences in your life and uh and even okay. down to the name Jay Gats because we talk about influence coming from all every all of our experiences everything that we've been exposed to so who right. are some, some more of the early experiences in your life that uh that got you on this path oh okay so so this okay so my first 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 so my my tutorial journey has kind of gone in um obviously different directions so my first uh my entry was actually through um and wood and i believe y'all y'all both know mr gresham right yeah y'all know Leonard, Leonard, okay right so yeah. my first introduction to um men's where it was really with uh mr gresham uh, and I think that's really where uh, with Mr. G was really when I got a sense of uh, what real studying was. You know, Mr. G, uh, he had a uh, has a studio in uh, Charlotte and uh, he would sit. Uh, I would go to his studio he, and sometimes he would just leave. He would like let me in and he would leave for maybe like eight or nine hours and he would just leave like a, um, a thing of tapes for me to watch. So I would be watching like. Uh, Ralph Lauren runway shows, Giorgio Armani runway shows, uh, Donna Karen. Uh, I mean, literally everything. Um, I mean, we did so much. I mean, watching all of the Fred Astaire, Cary Grant films, Clark Gable. I mean, everything. So Mr. G really made me solid into menswear. And uh, ironically, this is what makes my, what I love about the story. He told me about Avery Lucas and Dr. Churchwell long before I knew them. Mr. Gresham did. He told me about Avery, Avery Lucas and Dr. Churchwell. He told me both about them. So uh, I was blessed enough to meet them as my career, you know, moved forward. But Leonard Gresham is definitely, I would say, the guy that really like made me solid in men's work, started me out taught me, you know, the difference in what, you know, this is this type of tie, this is this type of tie, Sea Island cotton versus this type of, like, I mean, he really made me solid. So Mr. Gresham um, definitely is um, on there. Uh, Terry Corbett as well, Purpose. Um, Terry was around back then. Instagram was not uh, around. 
So all we really had was Facebook. So Terry was on there. Um, Angel was on there. Gibo was on there. A, a brother named Kamal. Um, he has a brand called Camston. We actually post him on, on uh, mm -hmm. RBM group a lot. He was at Brioni. A brother named Bevan. He was at Brioni. So at the time when I was coming around, it wasn't as congested as it is now. And right. two, there were a, it was small enough to where if you were doing something that was not a good look, somebody would be like, hey, yo, you need to chill. Like, whereas now you can't really do that because it's too, it's so congested. And unfortunately, like a lot of people as far as skill level and presentation think they're way better than they really are. Yeah. Yeah. Product of the times. Product of the times. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But yeah, Mr. Leonard Gresham, uh, Gibo, Angel, trying to think of who else did I really? Because see, once I started studying with Mr. A at the Lucas Dress Academy, like all of that stuff like that I had learned, it I don't want to say it got washed away, but it kind of just got like placed in storage for like a year and a half. And then maybe like two years later, when I when my mind was just open to a new world, then I really knew how to like I had a better understanding of that stuff. So right. Mr. Gresham made me solid, whereas Avery Lucas is one of those individuals. St style with him is more of a um, it's more psychological and philosophical with him. Like, you know, it's philosophical. Like with Mr. A, I studied style as a B alone. That is why I can look at James Brown and Prince and be like, oh, that came from that. Yeah. Because I studied style as a being. It, it wasn't more so about the suit, the shirt, the shoes. No, nah, it was everything. Because right. that's how Mr. A is. Like to make him, you know, to make him feel good and, and like to be an expert in his opinion at that time. He's like, no, you got to know how to talk about everything. If you can't talk about everything, you're a specialist. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Because, I, you know, at the time I had been doing all this work, reading all these books, you know, my, my closet was looking nice. You know, I had some, some nice shoes. I was feeling good. And I, I remember getting off the phone with him that night. I, I felt like I needed to start all over because he he had just uh, made mention of so many things that I had never heard of. Stuff I'd never heard of. So for those who are watching and listening, give a quick update for or introduction to many probably about Mr. A his credentials, because when you hear what he's done, yeah. the things Jay is saying, you'll be like, oh, OK, yes. so give us a quick little synopsis right. of, of his background. So, so Mr. A is a um, well, Avery Lucas. He's a, an actual bespoke tailor. He's a bespoke tailor. Um, but what really makes him different from other tailors, like whereas a you have a Leonard Logsdale you know, gentlemen of that nature that do produce bespoke goods. I think what separates Mr. A is his taste level. Because unfortunately, a lot of times when you're dealing with tailors head on, you, you aren't really dealing with the most tasteful individuals. A lot of times they're great at making the garment, doing the adjustments, but as far as the execution of how to wear it, that's not really what they specialize in. Whereas Mr. A is one of those gentlemen, he specializes in the make and the execution. In addition to him um, doing a lot of the clothes for several of the Spike Lee joints, Mo Better Blues, Malcolm X, and he has some other film credits too that we'll eventually be talking about um, in the magazine. But uh, I mean, he's made clothing for Dr. Uh, Andre Churchwell, Keith Churchwell. He's been the head tailor at Alfred Dunhill. Uh, he's worked at Ralph Lauren. It's not too much he hadn't done. I mean, he graduated from the Fashion Institute of Technology. I mean, one of the absolute best to ever do it. I mean, this, I mean, like, again, there, this man has been mentioned in, uh, I mean, his name is all through a lot of the men's publications in the nineties. You just have to do the research to, you know, to, to come across it. But I mean, Avery, in my opinion, he's the most stylish. Um, he's not, the, he's one of the most stylish, but I think uh, as far as men's wear concerns, I think he's one of the, um, if not the greatest, one of the greatest minds, like period. Like a lot of people do credit Alan Plesser as being like the greatest where it's Avery. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's Avery, like Man, for sure. 
No disrespect to Mr. Flusser. Mr. Flusser's great. I've read his books. They're great, but he's not Avery. Yeah. No, I, no I'm, and I mean that respectfully. No, right. I'm with you. I started with a lot of, you know, dressing the man and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Get your feet wet, and I think that's appropriate. But to what right. you're saying, uh, Mr. Avery Lucas takes it to that philosophical. It's almost like yes. Jackson, where it's deeper than just the five guys on the court in the basketball. There's a spiritual aspect almost to it uh, that takes you Very from so. an execution level to a championship level. Um, you know, that's the difference there. Look, we've covered a lot of great things here in this episode. Jay's going to stick around. We're going to do a part two um, and we have more information coming. You're going to, you don't, don't, don't miss it. Don't miss it. It's the very <laughs> word. Uh, 